Welcome to All Write in Sin City, a podcast about writers and writing in the Windsor, Detroit region. Your podcasters today are Sarah Jarvis, former bookseller, publishing rep, and literary festival chair, Kim Conklin, Windsor based writer and filmmaker, and me, Irene Moore Davis, author, educator, and local historian. have our guest uh, Patrick Broad joining us for our little chat the, before our interview with him. And um, we're wondering to, today, what are some of the works of nonfiction that have had the, the greatest impact on you? Irene, what do you think? You know what? I, I really find I read a lot of history. Um, so, you know, in the nonfiction category, there are so many excellent works by, like, Carolyn Smarts Frost and Brian Prince. I mean, I've got a home in glory land. It's just one of my favorite works of nonfiction ever. It's partly because it's about this area. It's partly because it's written by a good friend. And it's partly because it's just a great book that reads like a wonderful novel, only it's not. Um, Brian Prince has certainly done a lot of wonderful work about black Canadian history that's had a huge impact on me. Uh, I Came as a Stranger is a great example of that. Um, Natasha Henry has done some wonderful work on emancipation that uh, has had a tremendous impact. I just love the way that it's written, the fact that it's so readable and, and so enjoyable. And certainly Afua Cooper, things like The Hanging of Angelique. Um, really have had a, a tremendous impact. But also, I love the work of Sarah Vowell. I love the way that she combines history and humor and really uses that uh, comedic sense to bring history to life. That's cool. I find I read a lot of fiction, and so for me, um, I don't read a lot of nonfiction, but uh, a friend who was a fellow uh, book sales rep said, this made me think of you, and she handed me a biography of Artemisia Dentalishi, uh, and I'm, I think I just blew that pronunciation, but the woman artist, the Renaissance uh, woman artist. And it was such a compelling story. It, uh, I still don't have no idea what, say, the murder of Holfenes, uh, a woman sort of slashing a man's throat, had made my friend think of me. And I hope that wasn't the image that she had, but uh, it was just such a fascinating story about a woman in her time and forging her way and it again it, it's the sort of thing that reads like a novel as well and because my head is stuck a bit in the Edwardian era um, and post-Edwardian I've read a lot about the Bloomsbury group and uh, just it's like being at a dinner party with these crazy artists and writers and uh, I'd have loved to have been a fly on the wall at one of their teas and when my mother and I visited um, the, the Garson Doom farmhouse where Virginia Bell and all that gang hung out it was like coming home it was it was incredible because and since then I've just been fascinated with all of that so it's it sort of I, the impact the biggest impact that a non-fiction work can have can be opening up a new world for me and making me feel a part of that Kim what about you well actually you just led right into where I was what I was going to talk about um, actually I like essays I once read an essay in the Boston Review on the history of miscegenation laws that set me down an entire historical project um, and I also like to read history. But the way the, fr the question was phrased is what had the greatest impact on me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, what have I read in nonfiction that actually changed the way I think or the way I live? And it's kind of a weird list. Um, there was, it, some of these books were like old when I read them. They were classics already, but like Diet for a Small Planet. Francis Moore LePay. I have flirted with vegetarianism, you know, most of my adult life. Um, Blue Highways by William Lee Heaton. I mean, that's how you write travel. That's just amazing, right? And uh, but my all-time favorite is definitely The Truth About Stories by Thomas King. It just mm. spun my yes. head around. Yeah. I have had I have had lines of that engraved on the back of iPod pods and stuff, and you know, I mean, just that amazing book, amazing. Book. Yeah. So. And Patrick, what about you? Are there any non-fiction books that were just sort of seminal for you that, that just hit you at the right time? Well, I think Michael Bliss's writing, especially his Discovery of Insulin, which is a book about the discovery of insulin. Let me call a spade a spade there. <laughs> and uh, it, it was such a, a well-written book and really very compelling. I mean, very, the whole drama of these two unlikely guys renting a lab somewhere in Toronto 
and somehow coming up with this earth-shattering discovery practically out of nowhere. It's such an amazing story still, and Bliss told it fairly straight as a, as a real well-researched piece of history, uh, but still one that was really was just a page-turner, just an amazing book. Yeah, and I think that's the key, isn't it? Is to for it to have impact, it's it's got to be it's the subject, not necessarily the subject matter, but that can do it. But I think it seems like we, we like the ones that tell a good story as well. Yeah, or that at least articulate a point of view in a way that's really memorable. I mean, I remember in university just feeling like I'd been struck by lightning when I read Edward Said and James Baldwin. They weren't necessarily storytelling per se, but but they were able to articulate this uh, vision or, or this opinion through their essays in a way that was just so compelling. And those are great role models if you're uh, looking for ways to uh, make a, an argument uh, that really sticks with people. Hmm, that's great. Speaking of making arguments, we have a lawyer with us today. Patrick Broad was born in Windsor, Ontario, and he was called to the Ontario Bar in 1977. He's been practicing law ever since, most recently as senior legal counsel for the city of Windsor. But he's also a well-respected historian. He's written a lot of books, including Sir John Beverly Robinson, Bone and Sinew of the Compact, The Odyssey of John Anderson, my personal favorite, The Slasher Killings, A Canadian Sex Crimes Panic, 1945 to 1946, Border City's Powerhouse, The Rise of Windsor, 1900 to 1945, the River and the Land, A History of Windsor to 1900, and his most recent book, Dying for a Drink, How a Prohibition Preacher Got Away with Murder, which was a finalist for the Arthur Ellis Award. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you. Yes. Welcome. It sounds like you're a kindred soul to All Right in Sin City. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is, this is the, the original Sin City. So as a, a lawyer, as also a historian and prolific writer, how do you typically typically carve out time for your writing? When, when do you get it done? Well, I've usually tried to uh, keep it to the evenings, and then, of course, there's the weekends to work on it. Um, I, I find with um, the advancing years, it's uh, somewhat difficult to try and squeeze it in on the evenings as, as things are going, but uh, that's traditionally the way I've tried to uh, govern working one profession against another. All of the books that you've published have dealt with some aspect of local or Canadian history. How do you decide which stories are worth telling? Well, I mean, there's a lot of interesting stories, but to my mind, I think it's important to look at a story that talks about not only the, the individuals involved in the particular crime or incident, but really the broader context of what it all meant. Um, you mentioned a moment ago the, um, the slasher killings, and that is, of course, a, a incredible incident in Windsor's background, uh, the only time I think we've ever had a serial killer in the city. But on a larger context, it also dealt with the, uh, the, the very fear uh, that really gripped the post-war period across Canada with regard to homosexuality. That people who were different had to be controlled, had to be subdued. And this case was really one of the leading lights about that. Um, it got publicized well beyond Windsor, and people were saying, how do we deal with this? These people have got to be put in their place. And if we, we can't, we've got to control them to the extent of making them invisible. So, I mean, it, it, yes, it's, um, it's a murder case and it's a murder trial, but it's a lot more than that. It says a lot about the broader society. So that's what I'm looking for. Is there um, a particular fact or story that is just gobsmacked, you're taking you completely by surprise that you've, you've come across? Well, the one I wrote about in Toronto I thought was really so unusual that it was crying out for a book and nobody had actually done a full treatment of it. And that was uh, Clara Ford, uh, her treatment in uh, Toronto in 1895. Once again, it, it talks about a, a broader context, that uh, she was a um, woman, she was biracial, and the context of her living in Toronto in 1895 is an interesting story in itself. But going beyond that, um, she was also um, possibly a homosexual. It was never really established. But she was certainly very, very different. She conducted herself and brought herself forward to the world very much as a man. And people in Toronto were just fascinated by it, especially when she was charged with murder. That here was this strange individual who was right out of the, the books that they were starting to read about maybe 
everybody wasn't heterosexual. There were varieties in the amount of sexual experience among people. And we have one of those people right in our midst here in Toronto. And then she gets charged with murdering a person. So it was a fascinating story. And of course, the way it, it, it evolves, not that I, spoiler alert, but um, that eventually, of course, her lawyers compelled her to act like a woman. And being a woman in 1895 meant that she had to be pure. And women didn't commit murder, did they? So it was a sure way to get out of things. Hmm. Did it work? Oh, of course it worked. Really? Women were on the pedestal. Women were pure. They didn't do things like that. So it was unthinkable. It was just unthinkable. No jury of 12 men in 1895 could convict a woman of murder because women didn't kill, didn't stalk and kill a man. Couldn't have happened. Just couldn't have happened. That's amazing. Yes, it could. <laughs> as, as we know now. Now, is part of the interest that leads you, are you attracted to stories that say something about Canada growing more tolerant or learning something? Or, I mean, is that part of what brings you into a story? No, no not, not at all. I, okay. I, I tend to accept you know, historicism. We have to look at a period and accept it for what it was. Um, I, I, but I, I do tend to look at this story as, as really explaining something of what Canada was at that time. And certainly, for example, in the slasher killings in the period 1945, homosexuality was so uh, considered to be so depraved, it just almost didn't exist. Couldn't even admit its existence. But it was there, and it caused all these people to be killed. And it caused this incredible incident that gripped the city for about a year and a half. It's been kind of washed under now, but it was really quite a... Windsor went through an entire moral panic you could, you could go down the streets in Windsor and there'd be nobody there. People were so terrified. But it's something we've kind of um, washed away. I was hoping through that book to try and bring it back again. Mm -hmm. Your most recent work tells the story of the murder of Babe Trumbull, a Windsor bar owner, by the Methodist preacher J.O.L. Spracklin in 1920. What was it about that story that you found so compelling? Well, once again, it has a, a much broader social implication than just the particular incident of these two men bumping into each other and one of them killing the other in a, an incident that lasted only a few seconds. But th this, Despite the fact that this, this incident was really just a momentary coming together and one person lost their lives, it, it, said, it speaks volumes about what was going on in Canada with regard to the way people governed their lives, whether drinking would be allowed or not. We'd, we'd really reached a phase in Canada where, coming out of the First World War, all drinking was prohibited. Alcohol was considered a demon. There was a form of prohibition across Ontario. And uh, a large segment of Ontario's population thought that that was the way to go, that alcohol was a positive moral evil and it should be abolished. On the other hand, it was the end of the First World War and a, very much of a cosmopolitan feeling had come into the country. And a lot of people had been to Europe and had been through incredible experiences and they simply didn't see any problem with take, taking a drink. Especially in a city like Windsor where a lot of the population was French Canadian or East European with a tradition of drinking on a regular basis. So you had these, these two social forces coming against each other and they really kind of, kind of emb uh, embodied themselves in the, the preacher, the guy with the gun, and the bar owner, Babe Trumbull, who is the ultimate victim. So within these two guys, you've got these forces coming together in a small town near Windsor. It's kind of amazing. Yeah, and, and Windsor seems to be sort of the crucible of, of, of a lot of that, um, the whole prohibition issue. Um, and so your book focuses a lot on how Windsor's reputation as Sin City came to be. And so we are particularly interested in, with this podcast, um, can you talk a little bit about Windsor's reputation and the rest of the eyes of Ontario and, and that, as how that came to be? Well, Windsor wasn't a sin city. Windsor was the sin city. Uh, it was by far the most depraved part, place in all of Ontario. If you read the Toronto newspapers anyway, that's what they would tell you time and time again. Uh, by 1920, when um, the prohibition laws in Ontario were still somewhat in effect, Windsor was wide open. Um, we were importing a lot of alcohol by mail order 
and selling it across the river to Detroit. Uh, people here were manufacturing alcohol at Hiram Walker's, importing it, and selling it. And so many people in this community, and their descendants will tell you, were part of the whole rum running uh, ethos that arose during 1920. And people in Toronto were following this with some degree of horror and fascination. Uh, they sent reporters for the first time down to, to Windsor to cover things because Toronto newspapers generally thought the province ended somewhere around Brantford. And they were sending reporters down here to cover what they called the Essex Frontier. <laughs> it was this kind of violent, out of control place, but it was still safely far away enough from Toronto that you know, it wasn't going to spill over. But it was fun to read about. I mean, you had uh, gun battles going on in Amherstburg for control of supplies of liquor. Um, some people said it was the biggest battle fought in that area since the War of 1812. I mean, this gun battle went on all night of groups of guys fighting each other out to try and get us, uh, caches of liquor. And these were being reported in the Toronto papers, and of course there were gun battles on the boats going up and down the Detroit River, speed boats going back and forth. So this made great press, and they wanted to cover it and, of course, embellish it somewhat. But of course it created a, a great political problem because then the government has got to do something about it. What? There are a lot of people who, who don't talk about it around here. A, a, friend's, a dear friend's late grandfather, we, we know he was involved because occasionally he would drop hints about a Model T being on the bottom of the Detroit River. But it has been a huge source of fascination to Windsorites. And, and is that because of the impact on the city, do you think? Oh, I think so. In, whenever I've given a talk on this book, People have just come forward very eagerly to talk about their relatives who were part of the rum running business. And really, a, a huge part of this community was, in one form or another, was, was part of the selling and transport of liquor. So, um, I think it's really colorful family lore at this point. Um, most people are just really are, are proud to have whatever uh, stories they have about their grandparents or great-grandparents who were involved in it. What do you have time to get your research in? Well, as I, as I say, it's uh, mostly on, uh, on weekends, weekends or yeah. uh, I'll, I'll take some vacation time and I'll go up to Toronto mm -hmm. um, because I, some of this had to be done at the Ontario Archives, so I got some of the information there. So. Yeah, so you, you follow, uh, are there any archives here in Windsor that you can access? Or I mean, it must be hard to do your research in the evenings, and I guess now a lot of things are online. But um. Well, surprisingly, a lot of it is, is kind of difficult to get online. You've actually got to go to the archives and actually try and dig up the documents. Um, but we, of course, we've got our two wonderful uh, institutions here, the Municipal Archives, run by the library, and the Windsor Community Museum, which has a, a number of interesting things. So those are available. And um, But there are a number of places in Toronto I had to go to look at things. Um, the University of Toronto uh, Library, the uh, Robarts Collection, uh, I found that very useful as well. So what's your next project? Well, I've been, I've been looking at a few things. Um, and one thing that kind of interests me is um, 1951, when the Ford Motor Company decided to leave Windsor and move its uh, production of automo automobiles to Oakville. And it's really kind of fascinated me that uh, that was really such a traumatic event in this community, that we had this major manufacturer that really made Windsor from 1904 city of Windsor was Ford of Canada, and in 1951 they decided, that's it, we're going. And the trauma that that created around the city, and you know, the, the business reasons as to, why did they do that? Uh, what was, it, was it really such a great idea? And um, I'm just trying to follow that as best I can and, and talk to um, the people or the descendants of the people who were impacted by it. But I think that's a really interesting story there. That's great. Sounds that way. So to get back to dying for a drink, we want to invite you to share some of your words with us. Okay, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, you could. Perhaps just a, a portion of it, because I mentioned about the Essex frontier. And one of the reporters that was sent down to Windsor, this is what he was writing in the Toronto Daily Star. Um, the scandal sold newspapers. 
The Toronto Daily Star sent down a reporter to monitor the bootleggers and describe the situation in the border cities. He found that not only was the shoreline poorly policed, it was composed of a maze of flats, lagoons, and small islands. The locals had an intimate knowledge of the easiest and most covert ways to cross the river. Everything in the area moved by boat, and not only were the provincials vastly outmanned, they did not even have their own launch. The reporter also visited the roadhouses, those dens of open debauch, as they were called. Roadhouses such as the Chapel House, now the Lido, used to be the Lido, were spaced along the river road and in the 19th century had been refreshment stops for stagecoaches. The goings-on at the roadhouses were all great fodder for the reading public of Toronto. According to the reporter, a night at the border roadhouse consisted of a feverish orgy, undressed and unashamed, unbelievable, if not actually seen. Having set the scene, the reporter described an evening at the Sunnyside Hotel in Sandwich West Township. There, men and women drank together in a well-appointed bungalow. Willow trees screened the veranda from the setting sun, and through the open windows came warm light and music and the sound of dancing feet. Young ladies and their escorts arrived for dinner. Waiters took their orders for cocktails. While it was illegal, it was decidedly civilized, and it hardly seemed the picture of a desperate public menace. But it had to be stopped. Thank you, Patrick Brown. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thanks for joining us. Look for more episodes of All Right in Sin City wherever you listen to podcasts. Or check out our website, allrightinsincity.com. For information and announcements of new podcasts, sign up to our email list or follow us on Facebook and Twitter.